So we want to start with uh, just exceptionally today at 6.30 because some of you had to attend the IRS. Uh, so we will go back to the normal time next week. So we want to continue with dimensionality reduction and visualization. I want to talk about at least about two other techniques today before we move down. Okay, so after I reduce the dimensionality and I have some ways of visualizing the data, what else should I know before I design any technique? So we want to talk about one more technique at least and hopefully two. So linear discriminant um, analysis, short LDA. So what is the difference we already talk about, uh, we already talk about PCA, and we said if you have some data like this, of course we conveniently choose a data that um, has a certain direction, and we said that basically what PCA does, it finds, uh, we, we calculate the average, we subtract the average, we find uh, a new axis, a new coordinate system centered around the mean, and then we go one by one, so there are the first principal component, the second one, the third one, the nth one, and then the hope is, okay, do I need all of that for the data, or some of them are redundant? Get rid of the ones that are not adding any value, and then we move on. So we, the PCA operates um, on the data itself, uh, is a linear method, and most importantly, perhaps, is unsupervised. So, okay. Well, why do we need another method? Well, data is complicated, applications are different. You always need two, three methods that do the same thing, or they claim to do the same thing, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the theory says, you go into the problem, you start uh, doing the design, and you realize the method that everybody is praising doesn't work for your application. So what? You have to find another alternative. So it's good to have a repository of different techniques. So now, if, if we talk about LDA, LDA does something different. So LDA look at the same data, let's say, and maps them, let's say, by some sort of projections, and maybe we project it also here. And the question is, which axis will give you more discrimination? So for example, here it's not easy to find a valley, whereas here you have a valley, so you can say here I have more discrimination. Which because I'm just putting random spots here is not obvious. Is it really? <laughs> Do you have a valley? So let's assume I have a valley because I didn't want to, unless I, I manually, let's say I remove this, I remove some of them, and then you get a valley here, let's say. So LDA does not work with principal components. It looks at what type of constellation or features or subspace gives me more discrimination to separate my data. So LDA then so hence operates on sort of subspace, feature subspace. Which means at some point we may not explicitly use features, so, but we are not operating also on the data itself. So it's still a linear method. So okay, I'm getting a new method for dimensionality reduction, but it's not a nonlinear one, still is a linear one. But it's supervised. Okay, that, that's a bigger difference. So because for, for PCA, you just take your raw data and you give it to PCA and say, 
give me the top three principal components, I want to work with three features instead of with 2,000 features. So the, we didn't know, do, does the data, how many classes, what is the data, we don't know. So it's unsupervised. Whereas in LD, LDA, we have to at least make some assumption that they, I have two classes, four classes, five classes. So I need supervised data, I need labeled data to do it. So the data for us is, again, you have your x1, x2, up to xn, and each one of them is a vector. So I have n measurements, and if each xai is um, m features, whatever features you have. So these are not scalars. Uh, these are vectors. And then we have n1 samples belonging to class C1. So when somebody starts talking about classes, you know, well, he's doing supervised learning. So in, in PCA, we never talked about classes. I don't care how many classes you have. I don't need a, a, I don't need a last column in your Excel file that tells me what should be the output. I don't know even what the output is. I just operate on the data. So fundamental difference. Things like that make, the, make that, that distinction that when you get a problem, you should know, should I use PCA or LDA? Fundamentally, they do the same thing, but this guy has been around for 120 years. This guy has been around for 10 years. So maybe people are biased to immediately use PCA because, well, we have more confidence in PCA. And of course, you do, you do, for example, let's say if you have two classes, you have N2 samples belonging to class C2. Now, LDA could be formulated at now find, go and find a line. Well, that's a linear problem. I don't want you to find a curve, find a line. So. And even if you find a plane, it still is linear. If you find a hyperplane, it's still linear. So you are not finding a surface to separate the data. Find a line that maximizes the class separation. Well, th this is this is 80% of what we do in AI. We do things to maximize class separation. This is what neural networks do. This is what support vector machine does. This is what k-means does, FCM does. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the ultimate goal for any supervised technique. Because you have labels, so I want to meet that target. I have to maximize the separation of the data. So I have to find, I have to find somewhere that I can say, so this, if this is the maximization, so if this, this point, then I can say this is C1, this is C2, for example. So that's, that's, that's very different from what PCA intends to do. PCA does not interfere in our business. I, say, I, don't, I don't know. You want to classify it? Classify it. I just want to reduce the dimensionality. And then you do whatever you please with the data. LDA is a little bit audacious, so let me look at the classes for you. Very different techniques. <clears throat> and depending on the application, their behavior will be, will be different. So, which means what? Which means if, if I look at this, and if I have some instances, So please consider when, when we plot spots like this, so there is no distinction because we don't know what data belongs to what class. But if I use some visual aids and say dots and circles and crosses and squares, and that means I'm showing you the label. I'm saying this is one class, this is one class. So this is my training data. I know that this is this and this is that. Here, I did it, yes. More discrimination, sorry. More. So
So we need more discrimination. Which point will give us more discrimination? <clears throat> so the, the, ch the challenge is this. So find that line. Find that line that gives you more discrimination. So if I, now if I go ahead and project all of this on that line that I don't know, so there is, there is a gigantic discrimination. So I can really say, this is one class, this is one class. We, we, we revisit this concept, this approach again and again and again and again. Because there is only so much you can do with the data that is labeled. But we will do it with different ideas, which is the fascination. So OK, so what does that mean? So why you have to find this line? But did, did you realize what, what, is the, what is the difference between this and what I drew for PCA? What big difference do you see? Well, this is also a line, fundamentally. What's the difference? Well, we have to find this line, which could be an axis, but it's not an axis. And it has a certain characteristic. It goes through the 0, 0. It goes through the origin. So this line is, could be written as this. So I don't have a bias. I go through 0, 0. Whereas here, so it's, I'm moving it because I subtracted the mean. So the mean is shifting things. So and then you can move and rotate in any direction. Here, I'm fixing it and say, no, no, no. So fi fix the line. So this is the line. Whatever you can do, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. You can only do this. So find that line. Of course, in different dimensions. It's not, it's not two dimensional, the data that we are trying to deal with. So in two dimensions may appear too easy, but it's not that case. So you are, you, are, you are operating on the data that you don't see. That's the challenge. So you, are, you have to design the algorithms that see the data and then operates on it. So the LDA says, find a line like this that gives me this. So what would be, so y is given, x is given, so we have to find the weights. So maybe perhaps this is the first time that we use this word, weights, which is a critical word in AI. So weights, weights, every piece of intelligence we define and introduce is based on adjustment of some weights. Weights are very important. And we usually we denote, denote them with W for weights. Because the synapses in the human brain, the adjustment and being inhibitory and excitatory, so we get, we want to imitate that in a very simple way in LDA. It gets more, more complicated as we go along. Okay, what, okay so what, what else we need to do? So we need to define a good separation measure. How do you know that things are separated? So that objective function is very important. Look, for example, we can look at the mean vector. We can say the mu i is equal 1 over n sub i sum of x when x belongs to CI. So now, I'm working on labeled data. So I'm doing supervised learning. I only aver I average the Xs that belong to the same class. I didn't have that information in PCA. Or maybe I had it. I chose not to use it. OK, because I didn't need that. I didn't want to bias my dimensionality reduction with my labels. Not every set of label is perfect, so they bring the bias of whoever labeled the data. So, okay, so then what happens if I define it this way? So if mu i tilt is equal 1 over n sub i, 
sum of y, y belongs to ci. So how about I formulate the mean with respect to the, with, with the line? So I want to find that line, right? I want to find that line. And based on the position of the line, in whatever dimension it is, I want to find the mean. So, but I cannot do that. So I have to bring x because I cannot, I cannot build the mean based on y. I have to build the mean because of the x's, because what is in the class. Well, of course we can do it because that's a line. And there is no plus beta because it's going through 0, 0. It makes things simple. Sometimes having an average makes things simple because we subtracted it. So then we had zero mean distribution. Sometimes having a mean and using it makes things simple. So two different venues that people took to define things. So OK, so I can write this one over n sub i, sum of w transposed x. x comes from the class c sub i, <coughs> which is what? So, so th this has nothing to do with x, right? This is my weights. If I take that out, this is 1 over n sum of x, which is this, which is mu i. So this is w transport, transposed mu i. So OK, now, now I have a way of bringing in the weights that I need to find in relationship to the average of the class. And I know the classes. If you don't know the classes, you cannot use LDA. You need to know. I have five classes. Class one, class two, class three. So I can build the average. OK. What is the driving force for separation? We will ask this question again and again. What is the driving force? What is the driving force for learning? And we will see we have very different driving forces. In neural network, we have error. In reinforcement learning, we have reinforcement signal, reward and punishment. In evolutionary algorithms, we have fitness. So you have a many different type of driving force. What does drive the learning, the optimization, the adjustment? the accumulation of knowledge. We have to know that. That's a design question. So what does drive the separation here? Because if I don't know that, I cannot drive my algorithm toward convergence. Convergence means find the best set of Ws that gives you maximum separation. So if this, if this line is here, it's not the optimal one, of course. So there is one. At least one. You need just one. If there is multiple solutions, usually you have, you have hyperdimensional situations. Usually we have more than one solution. All we need is one of them. So just give me one of them. But give me a good one. At least if you cannot give me the best one, give me a good one. So what, what is the driving, so which most of the time we call objective function. So what is the objective function, which has to be a function of w? Because that line, y is fixed, x is fixed. The only thing that can change is weight to, to rotate that line, right? That's it. That's the entire intelligence. Uh, is it that simple to you? No, it's not. Look, this is a high dimensional thing. So what happens if you are operating in five dimensional space? Can you imagine five dimensional space? So I'm moving a hyperdimensional plane. It's not a line. I'm talking about a line, but there will be no line. It will be a plane. So, and we don't see it. We cannot imagine it. We cannot visualize it. That objective is a function of W. And of course, we wanna, what we want to do is we want to maximize the differences between these averages. So if I look at the average, which is relatively simple to see, if this is my optimal and this is my first average and this is my second average, you see? So if I look at this, 
I want to maximize this. Right? Best separation. Keep them apart. They are different. They are supposed to be different. So find that line that the distance between the two averages is maximum. There are many, 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 many alternatives. So how do I find that? So again, if you just move this line, even in a two, simple two-dimensional case, you will find many, many situations that this is, this two, this two, uh, um, the distance between the two means are short. So they are close because then if you have, if you have two classes like this and I'm looking at this, that's maximum. But what happens if I do it this way? Then everything goes through this, averages will become the same. So it's important to define the objective as a function of weights to maximize this. So which is what? So which is the W transposed one, mu 1 minus mu 2? So I'm going back again because I don't want to work with the estimate uh, averages. I want to work with the actual averages and then bring in the W. So now I become. A. So you have to maximize this. Arc max, right, over all Ws. So calculate all Ws. Do you want to go over all possible values of Ws? <laughs> you could if it is a, I don't know, three-dimensional problem. <laughs> but that would be the exhaustive brute force approach which we just left behind in the 50s. So since 70 years, we don't regard them as intelligent. It's not saying that brute force approaches, exhaustive search that you can enumerate through everything, just enumerate through everything. Take every single value on W and check whether it gives you the maximum difference or not. It could give you the best value if you are operating in low dimension, but would that be intelligent? No, just, you're just brute forcing it. And we come back to this when we, when we visit the evolutionary algorithm. Anything that is smaller than 32 bits can be enumerated. Any problem that can be encoded with less than 32 bits, you can find two for loops and you can find the best solution. You don't need AI. Anything above 32, roughly, you cannot enumerate. There is no brute force. There is no exhaustive search that you can find the solution of a problem that has to be encoded with more than 32 bits. Again, roughly, 32 is not a magic threshold. So, okay, so this is what we have to do. We have to find the maximum value of this when W values change. And interestingly, we will work with the same thing when we get to neural networks. Maximize something, which is the error, minimize the, uh, minimize the error, as a function of W. But we are ignoring something. What are we ignoring? What is the problem if I do this? What is the problem if I just go after, find a line, find an angle basically, <laughs> that maximizes the distance between the averages of two classes, three classes, n classes that you have. Again, we kept it simple. We said two classes. You can have 500 classes. What could be the problem of this approach? It, it may find the maximum, the, the line that gives you the maximum distance between the averages, but the solution is bad. How can, how can that be? You're maximizing the distance, but the solution is bad? Yeah, because we are ignoring something important. And that's a, that's a challenge for deterministic algorithms like this. That's why neural networks flourish, because they, they do not ignore that problem, because they go through an extensive training. What is that problem? Yes. The data is always nonlinear. Any data that we work on is nonlinear. Applying a linear 
a linear approach doesn't mean we are assuming the data is linear. If the data is linear, you don't need AI. A linear approach means I try to separate things with a plane. That's it. Yes? Variation of what? Sample. Yes? So let me give, I, I give you two classes. This is version, version one of class A, and this is version two of class A. So the same, the same class, two methods give you two alternatives. One of them looks like this. So the class A has been found by one of the methods, and it looks like this. And the other one is giving me this. Which class is better? Has more data point? OK, so let me solve that problem. <laughs> which data is, which class is better? Which class is better? Yeah, the, the, the variance of data within that class is also minimum. The variance inside the class has to be minimum. The distance to other classes has to be maximum. But the variability inside the class has to be minimum, because you are saying these are the same stuff. If it is the same stuff, they cannot be very different. So we are ignoring that in this. If you use this objective function, you will find things like this, which totally your classification will not be solved. You cannot generalize because you are ignoring the nature of the data. So we are ignoring the variability. The variability inside classes. It's very important, the variability inside classes. So the variability, so what, what you want is this. Look, which one is better? Class A, class B. Class A, class B. Which one is better? Of course, this is better because it gives me more distance between the classes. So this is better. And then we said, OK, look, you have either this, you have, again, class A, or you have class A. We are now comparing the class with itself. And we said you have some normally distributed one, or you have something like this. And we said, this is better. The variance is low. So which means we want heterogeneity when we look at classes compared to each other. And we want homogeneity when we go inside the class. Inside the class, things have to be of same nature. Variance should be low. This is not just for design of new algorithm. This, is, this helps us to understand the result, analyze the result, because still, don't forget, Turing said what? The human is the ultimate validator of AI. So we are the one who says, no, AI messed up. Let's run it again, because I have a lot of variance. So OK, so what do we do? We can use, for example, the Fisher approach, Fisher's approach. And this is not the last time that we use the name Fisher. Normalize the distance, which is the difference. between 
the means by intra class scatter so normalize visual events when we say normalize something is uh, average divided by variance so normalize first of all the key word is normalize so if you want to improve this if you want to improve this objective function yes we know yes we know so this is just for to increase the heterogeneity between different classes we want to bring more homogeneity inside classes so this is interclass this is intra class you have to have that a statistical sense forget about equations we can always look up equations i always forget equations that's the reason i have my notes as as simple as maybe variance uh, what was variance again was it a square rule it doesn't matter you have to understand conceptually how things work we can always look up and as engineers when you go in the real world we have our lookup tables we have the IEEE standards we have repository of a lot of knowledge we think, look things up that's okay but we know conceptually what it should be that's what really matters so normalize the distance because this is what we have and this is distance difference is the simplest distance there is we call it l1 norm the simplest distance just the difference of two things so normalize the distance between the means by intra class scatter scatter is a fancy name for variance that's a scatter so a scatter normally scatter rather I don't know stochastically chaotically whatever not normally <clears throat> so okay so it comes down to scatter which I would say is the same as variance if I look things up in the statistics book, we don't have something called scatter. There's always variance. So I, I want to change the measure the variability. So, okay, so let's say I call it SI tilt, and I use a square to keep the tradition and notation of the variance, because I want to I want to measure the variance inside a class. If you use the sigma square one, you are calculating the variance of the sample. But now I'm doing it inside one class. So I want to have a different notation. That's all what it means. Why suddenly I'm using S and not sigma. Is the sum of Y minus mu I tilde squared Y coming from C sub I. So I'm, I'm calculating the variance for one class. And Please keep in mind, this is not necessarily the class that you gave me as label. This is the class that I'm finding. The, not the class finding, finding the line that gives me the discrimination between the classes. So I'm calculating that, and of course this is a function of W, right? The line is a function of W. So for different lines, I will find different variances. Okay, now I have a control mechanism to play with it so then the, the intra class scatter can be s1 tilde square plus s2 tilde square so I have two classes here if you have more than more so I add them because I want them totally I want this to have a low variance and this to have a low variance. So the sum of them should be minimum. Whereas the distance between them should be maximum. So how can we then improve the objective function? So we said objective function as a function of W. And the entire intelligence is in W. How do I find W's, the weights, such that I find the best line? That gives me the maximum interclass separation and minimum intraclass uh, variability. Is 
mu 1 tilt minus mu 2 tilt. Maybe I go with Euclidean distance. Who said I should go just with difference? So we usually call this one L1 norm, and this is L2 norm. So the distance metric difference or Euclidean distance. So, which is divided then by S1 tilde square plus S2 tilde square. So this is actually called, this is actually called Fisher linear discriminant. Discriminant. So this is a lot of statistical power behind it. And this has to be maximized. To be maximized. When does it become maximized? When this is a big number and this is a small number. Right? So I want a huge distance between the classes, and I don't want variance inside classes. So variance 0 plus 0, right? not going to happen. You have one point. <laughs> they will never be 0. But I want a small value. I want a million here, and I want 2, 3 here. So naturally, you have to maximize the Fisher discriminant uh, uh, calculation to be able to do LDA. So that gives us some sense that we can do things differently. That's all I want. We are not claiming that we covered PCA or we covered LDA. There is a lot of detail to these techniques. And we do that with many other techniques. So we cover, we get a big picture, we go in some details, we get a sense how it works, under, understand the basic underlying concepts. There's a lot of, I, I skipped 70% of PCA. Easy. So, but if you understand what is it about, you can always figure things out. Fundamental understanding. Okay. Good. We want to do something else. If I can keep this not moving, it would be challenging. Let, let it go up. It doesn't, wait. it doesn't want to play with us. So, next one, I want to talk about Tisney. I chose Tisney because it's one of the recent ones, really recent one, three, four years ago, five years ago. So that stands for T distributed stochastic neighbor embeddings. So Tisney. So whereas both PCA and LDA are classically understood as dimensionality reduction, you can also use them for visualization. But TISNI is specifically designed rather for visualization. Because TISNI, you can give anything, it can bring it to two dimensions. So you can plot it. So uh, we, didn't, we don't have a tutorial today, understandably. But in one tutorial, uh, uh, we will demonstrate to you, you can find it yourself, how amazing that is. That you get a 4,000 dimensional data, visualize it in two dimension, and get a sense of how complicated things are. Is that a design tool? Yes. Is that an interpretation tool? Yes. Yes. Sorry? You cannot see my writing. I have ordered thicker <laughs> marker. <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm, uh, what I'm screaming in the microphone. So I will try to write larger. So T distributed stochastic neighbor embeddings. I will try to write larger. So Tisney is a nonlinear writing nonlinear 
data visualizer. So first of all, it's nonlinear. We will see why. Second of all, it's a visualizer. So we classify it as visualizer. Some people may abuse it as dimensionality reduction. If, if you get your way and you get what you want out of data, nobody will protest. Nobody will say, no, you should not use TISNI as dimension. If you get away with it, you get away with it. What is supposed to be for visualization? So I cannot plot 500 dimensions. I give it to TISNI. TISNI gives me two dimensions. So I plot it. And I see the data for the first time. It's like there is a lot of, a lot of X-ray and terahertz radiation in the universe, and we cannot see it. This is, this is out of our frequency is really narrow between 400 to 700 nanometers. What, what happens if you could see X-ray and gamma rays? We would be Superman and Superwoman. But we can't. So Tisney makes us Superman and Superwoman for some seconds. You can see things that you, you never see, you never get to see. So uh, it, it goes back to t-test. So the t comes from the t-test. And uh, of course, the t-distribution, which is the normal distribution, normal distribution, And the, 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 the T, I have been trying to find out why it's called T. So perhaps uh, just one of the first guys who was it. So Fisher, again, surprise, surprise. Fisher, for the first time, used the variable T, and then we stuck with it. So there are some historians that say other stuff. But it was just the first variable used. So we call it T test. So it could be X test, or alpha test, or beta test. So don't take it too seriously. It could be any, any letter. But you cannot use anything else, because otherwise the, the statistician does not understand you. So we run t-tests. Um, so, uh, and we use, so TISNI does not use any, any norm which is distance, distance metric. So any method, anybody who does anything in AI, you have to measure differences, which is the distance. So you have to use some sort of distance metrics. Starting with L1, which is simple difference between two numbers, going to Euclidean distance, which is L2. You can do LP, so calculating Euclidean distance in P dimensions. We have other ones. We have cosine similarity. We have chi-squared. We have many, many, many more. Tisney does not use any of them. Tisney uses something else, something strange, something exotic. So it uses the Kullback, Libler, Divergence. So a, a very different type of measurement. So given two probabilities, given two probabilities, Or given two probability distribution, probability distributions P and Q, the KL divergence, if I, for sake of laziness, don't like the Kullback Leblor divergence, just say KL. So KL divergence. So it, given, given two probability distribution, P and Q, the KL divergence measures the distance. Measures 
the distance between the two uh, distributions as d of what is the divergence of p from q. And we use two bars. This is not conditional probability p given q is p divergence of p from q. How much does p as a distribution diverges from q? Are they the same? So if I'm talking about that, I'm talking about this. So this is p, this is q. How much do they diverge? How, how much they are different? How much they are shifted against each other? Because if they are different thing, they should diverge. If they are the same thing, is the same distribution, well, it's the same distribution. We use it as the sum of the probability of x times the log of the probability of x divided by the probability of x based on the q, so q of x, when x comes from capital X, from the universe of discourse, from the main set of events. So, so if I'm measuring the divergence of p from q, that's p times the log of p over q, element-wise. So because, well, then I have to do it really discrete, right? I'm not doing calculus here. I have to do a discrete, so I go, I will iterate over it and calculate one by one. So that's a formula. However, it's a formula similar to something else that we know. But whenever you use this, you have to define some other stuff. For example, so what is the 0 times log of 0 over 0 if something like that happens? Well, we define this as 0 by definition. You say if you get something like this, you get 0. What happens of log of 0 over q? Well, we say that's also 0. What happens of p times log of 1 over 0? Well, we say by definition that's infinity. And also we say the divergence, the KL divergence of p from p is naturally 0. You do not diverge from yourself, do you? You are always unified with yourself as a distribution. OK. So I want to I get out of this that we follow, and we do that again and again. I don't know how successful I will be. What I mainly follow is the, the process that people, as much as I could understand it from literature and verify the steps of individual researchers. Just reproduce that process that somebody went through this. How, what did they think when they came up with the KL divergence and testing? What was the guy thinking who came up with LDA? So I, for me, it's more important to understand that process, that design process because this all is in MATLAB and Python and R and JavaScript and C Sharp and oh, we'll just use them. Yeah. But we want to understand them because I want to do the same stuff because problems are getting more complicated, we want to improve. I want to understand that creative process which is inherently not just creative but also analytic in nature. You have to analyze what we have, find the weak points, and then try to come up with a different way. Everybody's Euclidean, Euclidean distance. I say, yeah, what about we talk about divergence? Well, of course, you have to, use, you have to know divergence. That's why it's reasonable and is useful to have a broad knowledge of all involved disciplines in AI, including math, algebra, and calculus, and statistics, and probability, and all other beautiful stuff. However, the divergence of p from q is not the same as the divergence of q from, uh, from p. 
So that, that's a major difference from distance. If you build the absolute value of A minus B is the same way as B minus A. The Euclidean distance between two points in two dimension, three dimension, one million dimension is the same. The distance between A and B is the same thing as distance between B and A. Doesn't apply to this. So which means what? KL divergence is not a metric. Well, we don't have time to go in all properties of what constitutes a metric. But just for the time being, no. L, L, L norm is a metric. Difference, Euclidean distance, is a, is a metric. It satisfies many conditions, among others, that the distance of A to B is the same as the distance of B to A. So whatever tool you use, know the tool. What does it do? What is the restriction of the tool? So example for using the KL uh, divergence, you can say the divergence of the observed from the normal would be very, very useful. In how far the data, the distribution of the data deviates from being a normal distribution. Wow, fantastic. Can you measure that? That would be great, because then I know I'm assuming my data is normally distributed. Is it? Well, roughly it is. OK, then move on. No, it's not at all. OK, don't do that. We cannot just make a fundamental assumption like my data is normally distributed and just hope that things go well. That's a naive approach. Sometimes it works, and then gets established in the literature as a naive Bayesian approach, because it worked. Many other naive techniques didn't work, and they disappeared. Or what is the divergence from the observed from, let's say, being a binomial distribution, any distribution? So when I, when I look, any of us who has taken at least have heard about information theory, as engineers, we should know about information theory. As info <coughs> As engineers, Shannon should be one of our heroes. So when I see that, it reminds me of entropy. When I see the KL divergence, it reminds me of entropy. I have probability times log of something. Isn't that related to entropy? These are questions that we ask when people give us something. When you give me that, when you give me that, I look at it and say, did you copy that from the entropy? That's the analytical mind that I was talking about. So we ask questions. If you forgot the formula for KL divergence, it doesn't matter. Just look it up. We have Wikipedia, for God's sake. But we ask questions to understand why you are using this. So what is the relationship to entropy? which is h of x, and x is capital X, because we calculate the entropy of the universe of discourse, of the superset, of the set that contains everything. Well, that entropy is the sum of the probabilities of x times the log of 1 over the probability of x when x comes from my superset. <clears throat> now, what does that entropy mean? Class of engineers, what that entropy means? What does that entropy mean? Louder. Disorder. Disorder. What does that mean for my bits and bytes? Disorganization. Disorganization. But everything is organized. Our computers are heavily organized. What do you mean? That's what was for thermodynamic. Engineers are not physicists. We are organized. <laughs> so 
What does that mean? What does it mean for us, information theory, channels of communication? Because of entropy, we have this. Because of entropy, we have this. So what does that mean? How many bits do you need to send this message? Anything that you don't need is your entropy, disorder. Anything that is redundant is chaos. Because you don't need it. You can do it with three bits, then don't use four bits. So entropy measures that, that level. So how much, how much do you need? How big should your channel be? That if by randomness you have error, you are error tolerant. When the package goes and one bit gets distorted, how do you reconstruct that? Is applied billions of times every day when we send emails again and again and again. What happens if one bit flips? Nothing changes in my email because we are using entropy to do stuff. So if I can rewrite this like this, and then I will explain at what. So this, if, if I say log n minus the divergence of p of x from the p u of x. So this is my true distribution and this is a uniform distribution. <clears throat> so I came up with this somehow because we want to understand the relationship to Shannon. So the Shannon entropy the Shannon entropy is the number of bits necessary to identify x from n equally likely possibilities less the KL divergence of the uniform of the uniform distribution from the true distribution, from the true distribution. Everybody cooks with water. If you find another liquid to cook with, just please send me an email because I love to cook. So <laughs> oil. oil cooks? Okay. <laughs> it's not healthy to cook with oil for eating. <laughs> so there is only one liquid. <laughs> so, I have never heard that. <laughs> okay, what is the Tisney idea? You know when I see people that are using Tisney, that are using PCA, and they don't even know that that comes from Shannon entropy. And then I just backpedal because I know, okay, YouTube AI. <laughs> so we have to go deep. You have to understand things. I don't need to understand the entire field of AI. No, I don't. I want to specialize in just one of the subfields. I just want to be a reinforcement guy. I want to be an evolutionary guy. I want to be a fuzzy guy. I want to be a deep learning guy. But understand your tools. How can you do this and not know about Shannon and entropy and information theory? 
So when I get there and somebody tells me that comes from Shannon Entropy, I put aside, I say, okay, so I didn't have an information theory a course in my class, so okay, so let, let, me, let me read a book. If this is my field, if this is my field, I have, to, I have to get to the bottom of it. I have to understand every piece and there are many things that I am on the surface because it's not my field. I, I don't go deep. I don't have time to go deep for everything. Nobody does. But when I choose my field, I should. So what is the Tisney idea? A fundamental, so what is it that Tisney want to do? That Tisney want to do this. Hyperdimensions. Two dimensions. So that's what Tisney want to do. You give a problem of, I cannot even draw any axis because I'm saying hyperdimension, right? So it's 500 dimensional, 1,000 dimensional. So you give a hyperdimensional problem to Tisney. Tisney want to give you a two dimension and say, look, so your data is looking like this. It's not always that, that, that straightforward. Sometimes you see that things are overlapped, right? And so on. It gives you a sort of the impression that it has classified the data, but it hasn't. Tisney is not a classifier. Tisney is a visualizer. It tells you, oh, OK, so the data is looking like this. This class has some overlap with this class. Can you use this knowledge in design of your algorithm? And this class is so obvious. It should be easy. So if I, if I, if I want to find some lines, you see, I cannot do it with lines. I need some curves. I need some curves. I need some surfaces. Tisney, among other, gives me that picture, oh my god, so this is, this is crazy difficult. Or it shows me, well, that, yeah, don't get scared of 500 dimension, that's easy. So it's a visualizer, don't get fooled by the appearance that it looks like classification, but it is not. So what is the challenge? So the, the, what is the idea? The idea is similarity In high dimensions, corresponds to short distance in low dimensions. Very simple idea. It says, look, the Euclidean distance, the best metric we have, if you go above 400, 500 dimensions, if you get to hyperdimension, Euclidean distance becomes useless. Because if you can imagine that hyperdimensional space, everything clutters in there. You cannot even see anything as if everything just gathers in the center of Milky Way galaxy. And you measure any distance, it's the same. You don't get any discrimination. Because it's just too complicated. So how can I do that? But if you bring it down from low, if things are really similar in that hyperdimensionality that I cannot master it with the best measuring distance that we have, namely Euclidean distance, or even the difference, the L1, if you bring it down to lower dimension, Similarity there will translate to close distance in lower dimension. Should. It should. Based on any intuition, it should. Such a simple idea. Yes. We can't. That's the reason that we want to reduce it. We can. You have to measure distance. But our distance metrics fail in hyperdimensions. That's a problem. 
That's a problem that we have. So that's another reason to reduce the dimensionality before you do anything with it. Because your classes in two dimension look like this, in three dimension look like this, in four dimension look like this, in one million dimension look like this. You just cannot separate them anymore. Not the way that we do it. They are still separable, but we don't have the tools to do it. Okay, so if this is the main idea of Tisney, similarity in high dimensions corresponds to the short, short distances in low dimensions. So that means Tisney has to be a mapping. I have to map my data to low dimensions with one condition. Whatever is similar there, it should be close here. But we cannot trust the distance metric. I know. W what am I talking about all the time? Callback labor divergence. We are hoping that that does a better job than distance metrics because it calculates divergence. OK, what, what could be the challenge? What could be the challenge? If you can get all sorts of crazy data, but some of the test data that we have, for example, you can get data like this. Again, in hyperdimension, not just in two dimensions that I'm drawing on the board. Now, if you have data here, and you have some data here, you can measure this distance, and they seem to be similar, but they are not. <laughs> because in order to get from this guy to those two guys, I have to go here. This is the distance. This is not the distance. So this could be perplexing. Perplexing for any distance measurements. So things like that, that things get really close. You think they are close, but they are not close. <laughs> what do you do? We cannot even imagine it. I have, I have still difficulty. I, I visualize this in three dimensions. I say, yeah, OK, so this is your data. Yeah. So actually, this is vacuum. You cannot go through vacuum. Is there such a thing in data that you say you, cannot, you can only travel through the wormholes? I don't know. Yeah, difficult to imagine. Yes. Not at this hyperdimensionality. We are, we, we are alluding to something like support vector machine and kernel trick that we will come to. That sometimes, this, this is the crazy part of AI. Most of the time, we try to bring it down from hyperdimension to lower dimension, make it simpler. Sometimes, we bring things from higher dimension to even higher dimension to see things. But as we will talk about, when we get there, we actually don't do it. That's a trick. We don't go there because it's a scary land, piece of land in the hyperdimension. We don't want to make it more complicated. So how do we do this? So th this is, again, this is a textbook example to show, understand this as a tube, and the data is only inside the tube. You cannot go outside of the tube. There is no air. What does that supposed to mean? Well, that's the nature of data. You, got, you, can, you have to move here. So similar data is inside the tube. You cannot cross from this point of the tube. You cannot cross from this side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other side. You will die. You need a wormhole to go from here to here. So that could be a problem. How much time do we have? OK, 10 minutes. Can we finish ten, just in 10 minutes? I don't know. We will try. <laughs> we will try. So, Tisney minimizes the sum of KL divergences over all data points using a 
gradient descent, gradient descent method. This is the first time that you are using this word, this phrase, the gradient descent. So the objective is we have the sum of the divergences of pi from qi over i. So which means we have to do this, the sum of, the sum of over i over j p j i, and we use the bar, for some reason we keep that notation. So I want to I wanna measure the divergence from uh, p j from i. So I keep that notation. But for scalar, I do it just one bar. Log of p j from i over q j from i. So I'm talking about this, this guy. So this is pji. This is qji. A little, bit, a little bit difficult notation. But I just go, I have a list. I have a vector. I go through all of them. So I have a p. A distribution is a vector, right? p and q are vectors for me. I just go through one of them and look at finding the divergence pairwise. <clears throat> so similar. now. The trick is this. The trick is this. And then we would be theoretically done. So the p j from i is basically the exponential function of minus the Euclidean distance of x i minus x j squared over 2 times sigma i squared over the sum of if k is not i, exponential function of minus distance of x sub i minus x sub k squared over 2 sigma i x squared. So if this is in high dimension, So if this is the high dimension, I'm looking at the divergence from points to points. If this is in the high dimension, then in the low dimension, I should have this. Qj from i is exponential function of minus distance between y sub i minus y sub j squared over the sum of all cases that k is not i, exponential function of minus the distance between y sub i minus y sub k squared. And this would be in low dimension. So here, I'm not saying how we calculate this. Because I'm assuming this normally distributed, so I need the I need the variance to do it. So I'm not talking about that, but you need to do it. And here we set this to one over square root of two. Just fix it. And then we continue. So if if they are similar, if they are similar in high dimension, they should be close in low dimension. So you have to do these calculations hand in hand to make sure. And then you map Q to Q. So maybe I should not have mentioned this P and Q. So P in high dimension is Q in low dimension. I'm mapping to P to Q. And I want to what? Minimize the divergence. Right? 
things that are similar here should be close here. It should be the same data. It should be the same distribution. But I'm compressing it. I'm taking it and compressing it. But the same way that I compress it, I minimally also pull them from each other. It's, it's something strange that Tishney does. Because if you compress it, just compress it, it should get worse, right? You have a cloud of data point. If you just compress it and bring it down, it becomes worse. But somehow you compress it and you pull it from each other. You compress it, you pull it from each other. So similar here, close here. Similar here, close here. So you map that, and then suddenly from 500 dimensions, you can come to two dimensions. I have not seen anybody doing three dimension. Because we want to we wanna have a nice visualization, right? Two dimension is fantastic. I just look at it and say, ah, oh, OK, my data look like this. So OK, so what does that mean? That mean for us, for dimensionality reduction and visualization, there are many methods, but in the course projects, I assume that we know at least about three. We did not talk about all details. And anything that we do at the end of the week, I will, submit, I will upload more reading materials to fill the gaps of the details that we, have not, we are not covering in the, in the lectures. Hopefully, we get a more complete pictures. So regarding data reduction and visualization, the assumption of the course is we know PCA, we know LDA, we know TISNI. So and after I submit the additional review, additional reading material, if you need to, you take a look at them. I, do, I will try to really upload small documents, not 50 pages of a book chapter or something, or rather a video that is aligned with the way that we talked about stuff. And then you look at it. So again, not understanding every single step of it should be OK. But do you understand how it works generally? Because we want to be able to just, OK, so I know how it works. I know, I know. Oh, yeah, the divergence, I know. So let me just use the Python, the PyTorch, whatever. OK. Do, do you have the understanding to have the luxury of just using it? If you know, then that's fine. We just use it. I use it. Everybody else uses it. I, I don't implement it from scratch. Why should I do that? Many other smart people have done it. So we will continue next week, and we will go into uh, encoding, embedding, and how do we do experiment next week. And the first quiz is coming this week, this weekend. Are you okay with having quizzes at weekends? Okay, we will do the first quiz will come this weekend.